tribulation and the part in his salvation happiness is the Lord real joy is mine no matter if teardrops start I found the secret it's Jesus in my heart happiness is to be forgiven living a life that's worth the living
general uh, love for you that is in so many people who are here. And yet we see in the entertainment industry, we see in, uh, in the, the scholastic uh, arenas of the, of the colleges and so forth across the nation, people have begun to abandon you and to uh, turn even to our enemy. And we pray, Father, that you will help them to realize that this is a huge error before it's too late for them. We pray that you'd help us in our, our love for our children to know how to help them to grow up wise and well in this country while we go through these times. Please give them wisdom and insight and a, a joy of knowing you because uh, it truly is a joy, Father. We thank you. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to pray for our sick and those who are, are hurting, we pray for Isabel and for her mom and for her dad. We pray that uh, uh, things can be worked out, that, that she can be with her mom uh, the majority of the time. We just know that a, a girl this age really needs her, and uh, we pray for getting to, to know her a bit and uh, especially getting to know her family. Father, we pray that you be with Sandy. Protect her as she goes into this time where she gets, has uh, this procedure on her eyes. We pray that it will come out perfectly and that she'll be able to uh, just enjoy a long season of very clear sight. We pray for our time tonight, God, and help us to understand this man, Daniel, and uh, the great service that he gave you and uh, rejoice in the, in the courage that he has and Help us to understand our lives better because we spent time here around your word and thinking about what you've done. Guide us as we look at these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, we are again in Daniel, the fifth chapter. We've been working through uh, Daniel's life in the first several chapters of Daniel. You're going to find uh, Daniel and then his friends, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their story. Uh, we've already been through the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, we've had the story of how they refused to uh, worship the image, and as a result, uh, they were thrown into the fiery furnace. And there was uh, apparently not three of them there, but four. There was a, one who was as the Son of God amongst the uh, three of them in the fire. And when they came out, there was no smell or anything, and they were... Uh, saved through that event. Kind of everybody knows that fiery furnace story, but we like to walk through it and uh, know it again. And then we've talked about uh, Daniel, and uh, we've talked about his courage and his willingness to stand up to trouble, how he's able to understand dreams, and uh, first of all, understood uh, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And it helped him to not just understood it, but Nebuchadnezzar gave a special problem in that Nebuchadnezzar said, uh, look, I, I've had a dream. Now what is it? You know, in other words, I'm not telling you even what it is, but you have to tell me what I dreamed, and you have to tell me its meaning. Now Daniel was able to do this, and uh, uh, so Nebuchadnezzar uh, was quite impressed and uh, agreed to follow God, and he did for a time until he had a second dream. Uh, this time it was a dream about uh, a big tree and how it was to be cut down, and, and uh, uh, but it was the, tr the stump was to survive, and uh, that's kind of what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He uh, went a little bit nutty and uh, uh, ate grass, and his fingernails grew long like claws, and he went about really unclothed. And, and uh, uh, what was that? It was one of the animals. And uh, eventually, after uh, a period of time, apparently about seven years, he came out of that. And when he did, he was able to say, well, God, this God of Daniel, uh, he is really the true God. And uh, he sent out a missive everywhere that everybody in his uh, in his. Uh, Familiarity, any place in the, any country, 
You want to be sure they heard about Daniel and Daniel's God. And so that brings us really around to this chapter where we're now not in Nebuchadnezzar's reign anymore. We're in Belshazzar's reign. It's the grandson of, of Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, where we've had writing come up on the wall one night. Uh, uh, Belshazzar and his uh, our cabinet, I guess you could say, the, the other rulers and guests and so forth were gathered in a big hall, and they started the banquet and to eat and to have a big feast there in the front end of five. If you want to be looking at that account, uh, you can see that there was a big party going on, and uh, there's little spoken of about actually eating anything. It says it's a feast, and that's about the last you know of the eating prospect. Instead, it goes to drinking. It's all about uh, getting out something more unusual to drink from than ever before. And so they pull out the vessels from the temple that had been brought uh, from Jerusalem when the Israelites were uh, made captives. And uh, so they bring these out and start drinking from them. And as they're drinking, this hand appears kind of against the wall it's a disembodied hand. You can't really see any body attached to it. It starts writing on the wall, and it writes many, many tekel who farce it on the wall. And everybody kind of goes, well, what does that mean? And they're terribly frightened because it's quite an experience. You know, we, we've asked ourselves, you know, what, what would happen if, if a hand appeared right up here and started writing on the wall when, you know, none of us had had anything to do with it. Even today, with all the special effects that we have, you'd be pretty impressed. Well, in those days, there weren't those kinds of special effects, so you just knew that something uh, marvelous was afoot. And so uh, King Belshazzar calls for all his uh, advisors, and none of them can figure out what this is. And uh, there was a a woman there, and she says, now wait a minute, there's an older guy here, I didn't say older guy, but he's been here for a while anyway, uh, there's a fellow here who in the days of your grandfather, uh, he, could, he could make out these kinds of things. And so, let's get Daniel. And so Daniel comes in, and he explains that, you know, all of these things that had gone on before, and how Belshazzar, in a certain sense, Daniel is basically saying, you know, Belshazzar, you've had a chance really to know these things from your grandfather. And uh, this is this really the stuff I'm telling you. It's a history about what's actually happened in this land. Now we get to chapter 5, verse 17. And uh, I'm going to skip past that one, maybe come back to it. Uh, then Daniel answered and said before the king, because the, the king said, well, whoever can tell us all this stuff gets all these tremendous gifts and gets to be third in rank in the kingdom, which really means that he was just behind Belshazzar. Uh, in any case, uh, then Daniel answered and said before the king, keep your gifts for yourself or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. O King, the Most High God, granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Now, I know I said grandfather, and in those days, uh, what you had was, if you wanted to say your grandfather, you didn't have a word in your language for grandfather, so you just said, my, my father. And then somebody said, well, I thought your father was, yeah, but his father, see. So you would have to, to work that out, but that's very common in the, in the Old Testament to be calling somebody uh, a father who is not directly your father, but maybe your grandfather or even your great-grandfather further back. So uh, that's, that's why Daniel says to him, uh, uh, the Most High God granted sovereignty, granted glory and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Uh, Belshazzar's father was named Nabonidus, and uh, Nabonidus was actually out on campaign at that time. In other words, he was fighting a war and had lost already, and uh, was not, the word had not gotten back apparently to, the, to uh, Babylon where this feast was happening. And uh, so this is what Daniel was saying. Uh, this glory and grandeur and majesty appeared to 
Nebuchadnezzar, your, your father, because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the people's nations and men of every language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed, and whomever he wished, he spared alive, and whomever he wished, he elevated, and whomever he wished, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne, and his glory was taken away from him. He was also driven away from mankind, and his heart was made like that of beasts, and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind, and that he sets it over whomever he wishes. Yet you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. But you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. Let's stop right there for just a second. Well, no, I'll, I'll read it on because it gives you the answer to the question I'm going to ask you. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines have been drinking wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand. Now, back up. This says, but you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. How did he exalt himself against the Lord of heaven? He did not follow like, he was not like his grand, like, like his, or like his father. Yeah. His grandfather. Right. He did not, he did not, he was not like his grandfather that like saw what, what he under, he under, his grandfather understood what his grandson didn't understand. Okay, that's he, right. He like, he, he took the pain, he took, took like, he let his greenhouse grow and everything, and then he understand right there and there. Okay, that, and then Belshazzar didn't learn from that, did he? No. He okay, was, what did Belshazzar do that was offensive to God? Drink, drink from the... Yeah, he drank from the, cups. from the temple's uh, hardware. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, that's one way he did it. What's another? He was he was praising he was saying gods that did not even exist, like yeah, were, they, silver and yeah. bronze and gold and bronze yeah. and so on. Things yeah. gods gods that didn't exist. Comment, just a second. Yeah. Killed whoever he wanted. He went with whoever he wanted. Okay, that that was his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar. So it's the guy that. He let he just was a person that ruled basically on the basis of his will. Whoever he wanted to kill and whoever he didn't, he let them live. Uh, Belshazzar apparently is not quite like that, but he has offended God in some ways. One of what you're talking about. There's another one right here in front of us. It, it really, really reminds me of that of where we started out tonight and kind of talking about this Grammy Award thing. You know where you got. You know, people just in the face of knowing that, that many people in the land will take great offense at what they're doing. They've gone ahead and done it anyway. Well, this is what's going on here. Belshazzar, he knows that these tools, those, these goblets and everything that they're drinking from, that they come from the old temple in Jerusalem, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so he knows that, and instead of honoring the God that... They are in trying to honor what they are there to honor. Instead of honoring him, they drag out all these other gods, silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone gods, which are, as the, the scripture says, do not see, hear, or understand. Or exist. You know, just, well, or exist, not like that. Uh, so he just says, uh, well, I'm just going to do what I want to, and I'll, I'll praise up and drink up and have a great old time anyway. Well, I think it's like what you said about drinking out of the, the, the goblets or the vessels from the temple. I mean, they were never supposed to be removed from the temple. Right. And then they're bringing them out and going, in your face, you know, here, let's drink the wine out of them. Let's all have a party and we're going to drink out of these vessels. Right. And, like, and to top it off, of course, they're drinking, sort of toasting these other gods around them. Right. You know, so, of course God is angry. What did you think? <laughs> But the God, Daniel goes on, he says, But the God in whose hand are your life breaths and all your ways, you have not glorified. So, uh, again, you, you should have learned from Nebuchadnezzar, he did learn to worship God. Uh, now, he may have been a tough king, that is, as you've observed, he, he just kind of put to death who he thought to be put 
he had been able to get that far. And Belshazzar, rather than being the kind of guy, uh, I always like to say this, that, that we need to be the little brothers. That is, we need to look at the mistakes of others and learn from them. That's, that was my, my defense and the, the reason that when uh, my older brother had gone through uh, the line of, of aging up in our family, I got probably 60 to 70 percent less spankings than he did because I watched what he did and I said, well, you know what? That's one way not to get spanked right there. Just, just do what you're supposed to do there. Uh, or if you're, or if you're, if you're going to do it anyway, then don't get caught, whatever. But, but the point was I learned. I was the little brother and I think that's what we have to be. And Belshazzar wasn't. He didn't take that Werner uh, cloak of mine and say, you know what, I'm here to learn. I'm here to figure out what life is like and what, what, what it should be. Let me pay attention to Grandpa and see what he had to teach me. You had something more you want to say to me? Like an example, like uh, Nebuchadnezzar is like he was on the wrong path. Like he was like, you know, like on the yeah, wrong path. Yeah, he did get on the wrong path. He, he was uh, one to the right path. Then he left it and he, he ended up being in this horrible condition for about seven years. When he came up out of that again, he said, oh my, I made a mistake. God is the king and I should bow humbly before him always. And then he sent out a letter to the entire kingdom to let him know, look, uh, you need to worship God. This is one of the reasons, uh, I'll say this again and again, that I'm convinced that when we get to Matthew, uh, the second chapter there, uh, you start reading about the wise men and that they come over from the east. I'm convinced that they had learned from Daniel, possibly from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had learned from the Hebrew people in their land through this time because we have numerous examples. We'll have uh, this one, these that we've had so far in Daniel. Then you've got the story of Esther. You've got how, uh, uh, what's the names of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah uh, went and uh, were the whole... Uh, Israelite family was able to go back to his, Israel and build up the, the uh, temple. So people in that environment where they had been uh, brought up to, uh, they all got news of Israel's God because Israel had been brought out of their own country and were slopped down here in this other one. I'm going to go back to this. Right here, can you see my red dot? Yeah. Okay, right here is Jerusalem. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his armies had come from way over here in this region, all the way around what's called the Fertile Crescent. Uh, they may have come across, it's doubtful, but uh, they come around this way and come down and they captured many, many people here in Jerusalem, destroyed much of Jerusalem, and took off uh, with them hundreds, thousands of Jerusalemites, uh, Israelites, and took them back into this part of the country and settled them up and down uh, the uh, Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And so people who were Hebrew, had, who, who believed in God, had been taken out of their country and brought over into here. And Daniel is one of those people. And so he's telling all the news about God and God's uh, grandeur and power and, and, and not just telling about it, he is allowing God's work, power to be worked through him and uh, becomes a, a kind of an object lesson you might say for the people in that area. So I'm convinced that uh, what happened was people in that area did know, they studied and they realized, you know what, uh, there is in fact a king coming to Jerusalem who will be born in this time Let's go worship him. Here's a star that we've been advised. That's what will lead us over there. So uh, that's that's all. Uh, to some degree, that's my conjecture, but it's based on some pretty uh, solid observation, I believe. So uh, we'll continue on here. Hand your life, you are your life breath and all your ways you have not glorified. Then the hand 
was sent from him, and this inscription was written out. Now is the inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parson. Uh, this is the interpretation of the message. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the scale, on the scales and found deficient. Peres, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and Persians. Uh, so that's, the, that's what he says was written. Many, many, tekel, who farsa. And this is, again, the interpretation. God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Uh, why do we know that's true? Does anybody know the rest of the story? Or we'll get down to it if we don't. Uh, Cyrus. Okay, Cyrus comes a little bit later. Darius is our next king in line, I believe. Darius. Yeah, so, or Darius, if you like. Yes, Darius. <laughs> I always call him Darius. I would call him Darius myself. You know, you just want to go throw one of those flags and say, hey, show us what the real pronunciation is here. <laughs> Darius, Darius, Darius. Uh, I'm not sure which it is, but it's D-A-R-I-U-S uh, in any case. So, but here's the interpretation of many. God has numbered your kingdom, put an end to it. So the end of the Babylonian kingdom is upon them that very night. Check out. You have been weighed on the scales and found efficient. And this, I think, is what uh, is in direct reference. Both of them really are. Uh, your kingdom's been numbered, and, and you know, you, you, God has, has kind of laid out the accounts, so to speak. Uh, and what I believe in kind of watching this thing and, and reading the, the sources that I have for uh, commentators and so forth, I get the impression that many, many, many Tekels and Farson might actually have been a kind of a common thing to be said in the marketplace. Many, many Tekels and Farson. That is, uh, uh, many. Uh, it would be, you've been, you know, I've counted everything. Maybe I've counted twice, many, many. Tekel, uh, you've been weighed on the scales. So, and, but things don't add up. Peres, your kingdom has been divided and given over. So, uh, that's the kind of thought process that I have. Is it's, This is some kind of a, many, many Tekel who farce it is a kind of a, uh, something you might say in the marketplace when you feel like you're, you're, uh, you're trying to finish up a deal and you say, now wait a minute, this is not working. Many, many tackles and parson. That is, uh, I've, counted, I've counted twice, I've weighed you, and it don't come out right. So uh, that's my suggestion. Then, then, then Belshazzar gave orders, and they clothed Daniel with purple, put a necklace of gold around his neck, and issued a proclamation concerning him. That he now had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. You may remember that I earlier said that Nabonidus, uh, Belshazzar's uh, dad, his uh, direct dad, was actually still living. So, uh, at least in Belshazzar's mind, he was. So, when Belshazzar says, You're third in line, he means Nabonidus, me, then you. So, uh, that's what they say. I mean, we like your, I don't know what they liked. What he had to say to them, I can't imagine that they were uh, thrilled about his interpretation, but uh, in any case, they, they said, well, you, you at least gave us what we looked for, an interpretation of what was on the wall. It says that same night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was slain. This is the king of Babylon, the Chaldean king. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. So Darius the Mede he comes in, sweeps out the old uh, crowd, uh, and, and puts them to death, which was pretty common in those days. If you took over somebody's kingdom, well, you didn't just sort of uh, exile them or something like that. You offed them so that none of them or their relatives, as a general, could ever be a problem to you. In a certain sense, one might look at this story and kind of say, well, how is it that Daniel lived? Well, I think Daniel had a certain reputation by then in all of the East because of the things that had happened for him. Uh, that uh, he had been able to tell these uh, uh, dreams and uh, 
to, do, to understand things. And plus, Daniel had been given a great uh, place of command and office in the Babylonian kingdom. So whatever he had run was probably running very, very efficiently. And uh, so when the Medes and Persians came in, they thought, well, here's a guy that knows what he's doing. We like what we hear about him. We're going to keep him on and uh, keep him in his place. We'll read about that a little bit when we get to the next chapter. Real quickly, again, this is the Babylonian Empire previous to the incursion of the Mede, uh, the Median or the Medes and Persians who are up in this area and way back in here too. Uh, they come down and take over the Babylonian Empire. And then... They, they uh, basically rule over this big area. I don't know if you can place things real good, but here's the Caspian Sea here. There's the Black Sea. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. Here's the end of the Persian Gulf. And here's the end of the Red Sea. So uh, now on this big map, you can see here's the, the, end, here's the Red Sea. Here's the Persian Gulf. Here's Caspian Sea, Black Sea. And Mediterranean Sea. So uh, this big old area now, much larger than what had been ruled by the uh, Babylonians. Now the Medes and Persians are ruling over all of this land. And uh, the size of this, I think, does come into play uh, very early in Daniel six, uh, because something has to be done if you're going to be able to. Uh, govern that kind of a of an empire, you're going to have to have a pretty good arrangement for that to happen. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom that they should be that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom. Now, a satrap is what approximately a governor. A governor is not bad. Uh, uh, if we think of our governors today with more authority than that, uh, they, they would have had very uh, much decisive kind of governance. In other words, they would not have had to wait on legislature in all likelihood to do uh, some kind of approval of whatever they said. When they just say, this is how it, it goes, this is my policy, uh, apply it this way, this is what I want. Uh, so that would be basically what you have in, in these satraps or satraps. They're governors, uh, small kings, you might say, over uh, different parts of the kingdom. They would be in charge of the whole kingdom. So uh, you would assign a region to each one of these fellows, and then they would be uh, in charge of that region. It says, and over them three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them and that the king might not suffer loss. So Daniel, uh, you got 120 guys spread out over this area uh, to, to take care of it, to govern it, and so forth. And back here where Daniel is, uh, you have uh, him in charge of a third of it. Uh, so that's immense power that Daniel has just been given. And not everybody was happy about it. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Now, how many of you know what a Kmart is? Hmm. A what? A Kmart? Long and long ago. Long ago. We're not around anymore, are they? What happened to Kmart? They're gone. <laughs> oh, are they gone? Target. Yeah. Uh, there's Target and uh, uh, Walmart has come on. Uh, who knows what's next? Before Kmart, my goodness, there were Sears and Wal uh, Montgomery Wards. Uh, if you don't know those, those are just old uh, places that uh, sold great deal of hardware and so forth, different things, clothing. And, uh, so that's what I'm pointing out to you is that Walmart, for instance, comes to the fore mostly because of Sam Walton, who had this idea. He, what he called it was he, 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 he 
stack it higher and sell it for less was his idea. You, you, in other words, instead of making 50% on a little stack of stuff, you make 35% on a whole big pile of stuff. And the result was you made lots of money and lots of people went to Walmart because it was cheaper. And the result is because he was a better manager, or people were better managers in that way, Walmart becomes the, the place everybody went. I'm not saying it's still that way or anything like that. In fact, it probably won't stay that way. Uh, someone will come along and do a better job some way. Whether they get worse or somebody else get better, I don't know. But that's what will happen. Well, that kind of thing is happening here with Daniel. He began to distinguish himself among commissioners and satraps because he, has, he possessed this extraordinary spirit and he was able to make his area of authority, what he was over, what he was appointed to manage, it just did terrific. And since it was doing terrific, the king was no dummy. He said, not only will you be in charge of that, but I'm going to put you in charge of other places too. Uh, and so the king of plans to appoint him over the entire kingdom. King is 62. When he gets to know Daniel directly, uh, and he's probably getting older, he would probably like to slow down a little bit. Daniel's doing a great job. Why not just let him do the whole thing? Uh, then the commissioners and satraps began to try to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. This always happens. Uh, I speak from knowledge about Walmart because I, I worked there for nine years. Yeah. Uh, when somebody starts to step up the ranks and, and you think to yourself, well, uh, he's no better than I am. What's going on with him? There's this envy that starts to take place. And uh, you don't like it. And that's what happened in Daniel's case. The commissioners and satraps began to try to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. Well, they didn't like that he was getting to have this promotion. Uh, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence or corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in uh, What do you think about that? Unusual. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, t I know, I don't think it's unusual. I, well, I think it's unusual that an art like what you're talking about now, but Daniel, God was with Daniel. Yeah. That's why they couldn't find that in Daniel because he, he, he was, was a peculiar person. Well, he was committed to the Lord, right? That made it peculiar, peculiar now that he's gone. He was committed to God and God was looking after him. I mean, he didn't throw him in the uh, lion's den or have you got there yet? I can't help but remind how many of you have taken a test where uh, every question was meant to test your your character, your morality? A written test. I have. When I went to work for Walmart. Again. <laughs> you know, because you you sit down and they say, well, you know, is, is taking a pen from your employer, is taking a pen home with you from your employer uh, theft or not? It isn't. It isn't. Where did you, you pick know? up said pen? Yeah. Well, I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> well, then I'm in trouble because I pick them up at the bank all the time on accident. Well, well, well the the bank, everywhere I go, I take their pens. The bank wants you to take them. It has the their name on it. They're happy yeah, for you to take them. Just like we, I'm saying. We we got pens, we've got pens back here at the bank. We want you to take them. Oh, leave them to my children. They'll take them. I take pens on my work all the time. But you know what I'm talking about. If you're thinking about this in the way that I am, it is a matter of you taking something as small as a big pen, not uh, to be used in, in terms of a, an instrument of publicity. Right. Now it just belongs to the store, but you slip it in your pocket thinking, I need a pen, I'm going, they don't need this pen, it's mine now. Yes, that's, that's right. That is theft. That is theft. Okay. Well, that's what I'm getting at. I think that Daniel is that kind of guy who takes that test and passes it in flying colors. Right. Uh, when I I used to be good friends with our uh, uh, what do you call a person that's over resources, human resources officer. HR. HR. Yeah. And she just she you know once in a while we'd have this conversation about. Uh, 
new hires and how hard it was to find anybody who could rise to Walmart standards on their, their answering the questions on that test. Well, that's what, where Daniel comes in. He wasn't this guy. He was a guy that just did it straight. He just told it truthfully. And if it was a pen or something much greater, it didn't matter. He was faithful in small things. He was faithful in much. And I think that's where you and I really need to also be paying attention and say, look, I have, to, I have to make my life straight. I have to live a life that honors God in all respects. And, you know, I'm a fine guy to stand up and tell you that because I still struggle. I have lots of things that I'm still at work on. But I do know what I'm headed for. And I do know what I, I need to get to. And I, I'm not going to fall short of preaching that either. That you and I need to strive for what's right and do what's right. And not, not deceive ourselves into thinking, well, you know, it won't hurt anybody this time. Daniel wasn't that guy. He was a guy that, that you couldn't find any grounds for accusation if you looked. Most of us, if we're honest, if somebody went to work and, and looked, they'd find a ground for accusation. Not Daniel. And they realized it early on. They said, you know what? This guy's clean as a whistle. We're not going to catch him. Uh, he was faithful. No negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Then these men said, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. We noticed something about Daniel. What makes clear that whatever he does, all of this sort of righteousness, and a lot of people call that self-righteousness, it isn't. It's an effort to follow God and do what he wants you to do. Uh, so uh, they will say, Daniel, and all this righteousness, what it comes from is from his religion, from his faith. And that is what you and I need to allow to happen in us too. Let God drive us, help us to be what glorifies him. And that's what, that's what they found with Daniel. You know, if we can find anything wrong, if we can find any way to catch him up, it'll be because he worships God too much. So let's look for that. Then the commissioners, these commissioners and satraps, came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows. King Darius, live forever. Or Darius, however you said that word. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governors have consulted together. We all got together. You know, Mr. Big King, you're the biggest, you're the greatest. Live forever, buddy. Uh, we've all had this conversation. And that the king should establish a statute in force and injunction that anybody who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. So we want to make this rule and we only want it good for 30 days. Mercy knows we couldn't keep it longer than that. Uh, in any case, we, we want this rule for 30 days that nobody can make an appeal to a, a god of any sort except to you for 30 days. Isn't that a great deal? Now, O King, it's now O King, they go on trying to butter him up. Now, O King, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document, that is the injunction. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now, in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem, and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. So this was... Not a new thing for Daniel. He didn't wake up one day and say, you know what, I don't like this king. I don't like his hard and fast rule here. I'm just going to disobey him. This is something he'd been doing. And this law, this rule, was made just for the reason that Daniel uh, did, had already got this habit. They watched him, and they said, you know what, we can catch him right here. Uh, then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Uh, then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any god uh, or man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den? The king replied, the statement is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they answered and spoke before the king. Uh, Dan then they answered and spoke before the king. Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no 
no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel, and even until sunset he kept exerting himself to rescue him. I want to stop right there. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed. Now, I don't know whether any translations, English translations that are widely read, uh, convey what the original tongue uh, led. Uh, what it basically says is this, he was stinking to himself. <laughs> That's what he thought. Uh, oh, how I stink. <laughs> uh, because he loved Daniel. He thought Daniel, a great deal of Daniel, admired him. And I imagine, very probably, because of how he acts in this, how Darius acts in this story, that uh, Daniel and he were good friends. Uh, so he's, he's deeply distressed because he knows that he also lives by this law. You know, if, if I said it, if I made the law, then not only does everybody have to live by it, but I have to live by it too. Uh, so that's what who Darius was. Uh, it does say that even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue Daniel. If he could figure out some way that he didn't have to throw this friend to the lions, then he was going to. He's can, I tell you, can I tell you what my Bible says in the comments? Sure. On that, when you say he was thinking? Yeah. It says he went from a self-styled God to a fool in one day. <laughs> there you go. That's what it says in my Yes. Yeah. yeah, I like that. Uh, it actually kind of fits what we were talking about Sunday morning uh, when it comes to, you know, you've got to become a fool in order to know uh, God. And uh, so, yes, Phoenix. I forgot what I was going to say. What? I forgot, I forgot what I was going to say. You want me to remember for you? No, I forgot. I'm not Daniel. I can't do it. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see that. Yeah. <laughs> Then these men came by, and eh, I thought I'd been married for a while, but no, anyway. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. In other words, they came by and old uh, it's like you almost have this or I do have this picture. It didn't necessarily happen this way, but this is a picture I put in my mind for this verse that Here's Nebuchadnezzar standing here, and along to the, the satraps and all these old governors that made this law, this rule up, and they all come in as a group, and they look at Nebuchadnezzar, and they look over at Daniel, and back and forth to Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, and then they say, you know that it's a law of the mirrors of people, means and persons, and no injunction or statute which he establishes may be changed. Meaning, he needs to be in the lion's den. What are you waiting on? Uh, then the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. What does that discourage? What does that tell you? The king, the king cares for Daniel. He, like, he cares for Daniel, yes. What else does it tell you? I think Dar Darius believes in God. I think he does, too. Darius believes in God. He's, he's saying, look, I... I've done everything I can do, bud. But I had to throw you in there. But I know that your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. So uh, that's that's quite a comment from a, a, what you might call a pagan king. The, a stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles, so that nothing would be changed in regard to Daniel. So they're making sure that he's in there. You put him in there, you sign go in there, put a big old rock on the top of it, seal it up. We know he's in there. We expect him when we come out, when we open this up, there'll be nothing but bones down there where the lions chew him up and spit out the bones. A stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den. Okay, I already read that. Don't read it again. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no entertainment was brought before him. And his sleep fled from his up from him. So he stayed awake all night, it seems. Waiting and thinking about Daniel. Perhaps praying to Daniel's God. Then the king arose at dawn, at the break of day, and went in haste to the lion.
lion's den. When he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, as your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions. Then Daniel spoke to the king, O oh, king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, inasmuch as I was found innocent before him. And also toward you, O oh, king, I have committed no crime. In other words, Daniel saying, look, I did what I did, but I didn't mean it to, uh, to, to, to disobey you in some way or make light of your being king. That wasn't what I intended. I was trying to follow my God. Right? The king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den. No injury, whatever was found on him, because he had trusted in his, in his God. And I just want to stop right there and say, to me, there are two, we've always told this story when I was a kid, we always told this story like, almost like Daniel uh, was the lone good guy in this story. And that everybody else was bad, including the king was kind of bad too, because he went ahead and threw him in the lion's den. I don't know that I think that way at, at this point in my life. Uh, the king did what he thought he had to do. Uh, what is he was acting in keeping with the conscience. He was doing what he thought he should do, and uh, so the way I put it is that that Daniel was true to his God, Darius was true to his conscience, and God delivered them. And that's what I want us to realize is that no matter how troubled our world gets, you and I don't owe the enemy anything. We don't owe him compromise. And, and we're, we're going to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said before the king, well, we don't really know whether God, God's going to deliver us from the fire. We don't know that. But what we do know is we're not going to worship your gods. And, and I think that's the posture that uh, Christians need to take, too. Now, look, you know, I, I know God. I know what he wants of me. And I know what you want of me. Sometimes the, the world will want things of you and want you to behave a certain fashion. And you just have to tell them, no, I'm not, I'm just going to live this way. And if they put pressure on you, I don't know. I mean, uh, Jesus says that you'll be persecuted. He ensures, assures you of that. If you want to live righteous, that's what will happen to you. So uh, Daniel is a very good example. Give me, give us the heart of Daniel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the night. Thank you for the opportunity to study about Daniel. We do admire him. We do think that he was righteous and that he had a great heart for you, God. And we do know that we, in our hearts, we need that kind of love, that kind of allegiance to you. We can't get it all by ourselves. So we ask you to help us have it.